But again, today's intro to Flojo, there's a lot of things to cover, so I'm going to get started right away. So first things first, in Flojo, you'll notice that the interface here is kind of broken up into several different panes. Uh, at the very top, we have this uh, you know, pyramid with the kind of the spectrum coming out of it. This little pyramid is actually a small sub menu that allows you to save your uh, work. You can open new workspaces. You can open previously saved workspaces that are sort of in recent memory um, and a few other things uh, included on that list as well. Um, then we have the undo and redo buttons here, kind of the top left. And then this portion up here is referred to as the taskbar. And so there's several buttons here that are particularly important to adding samples and working with the data once we bring it into Flojo. So the add samples button is pretty straightforward. This is how you would bring FCS files into the interface. Um, then we have a mechanism to create groups. So you can segregate your files essentially into different subfolders so that you can analyze those files separate and away from other sets of files. So this is useful, especially when we're running an experiment that goes over several time points and we need gates to be adjusted uh, for those particular time points. Um, also, if you have compensation matrices, um, you know, one matrix for, let's say, the files that you acquired on Monday, another, you know, group of files will have, let's say, the uh, matrix that you acquired on Wednesday, um, and then the third experiment might be on Friday, um, and that would have its own compensation matrix as well. So being able to group the samples into separate directories is, is a nice thing, and it helps us to keep organized. Then we have a method to compensate our data. We have a compensation wizard here. So that's what this kind of grayed out button is. But when it's all lit up, it kind of looks like that rainbow M. Uh, and then we have something called a table editor. I'll get into this a little bit later, but this is where we will go to create our tables um, to export either to Prism or to Excel or some other spreadsheet program. Uh, then we have our layout editor. This is the module that we will open up when we want to create figures like plots for um, our manuscripts. If we need to export images and things of that nature, the layout editor is a great place to go. And then the other buttons that we have here, the recalculate statistics, this is just a refresh button. Um, and this, you know, occasionally if you add, you know, files into the workspace, you'll notice it. Flojo sometimes might get stuck calculating something. So you can just click that button and it'll, it'll recalculate. And then we have um, something here called BD Research Cloud. It is our cloud-based um, system for upload and download of uh, data. You essentially can um, do a number of things here, but you can track your uh, experiments over time. You can upload data to experiments. You can import your own um, you can import your own cytometer, put its configuration in here, and you can essentially uh, easily create panels and purchase the reagents uh, for that panel using the BD Research Cloud interface. And so you have a direct connection there um, with Flojo, which makes it, um, which I think makes it really nice. Okay, then below the taskbar, we have some. Uh, a sort of a band ribbon interface. And at the top here, you can see there are different tabs. They're a little bit hard to see, you know, which one I've actually activated, but um, it, you'll notice it's kind of highlighted in orange on either side of the name of the tab. So as I click on these, you'll see that the ribbon underneath changes and they're sort of grouped together based on functionality. So the tools tab, for example, has a lot of tools to help you with, for example, creating Boolean gates or if you need to do cell cycle analysis um, or proliferation modeling, um, all of those specialized platforms are in kind of the toolbox, right? The tools tab. And then the configure tab has to do with, you know, how many columns you have presented here if you want additional columns, et cetera. Okay, and then the pane below that, this is our groups pane. So always Flojo will have a default all samples group and a default compensation group. So when you drag your files in, you will notice that all of your samples will populate to the all samples group and the compensation group will try to 
uh, grab all of your compensation files if they happen to be named a particular way. So we'll show you how to create additional groups here um, in a moment. Okay, and then the lowest area down here, this is where it says drag samples here. This is sort of the status area. This is where all of your files will reside once you bring in the data. Okay, now I have a folder here that's full of files. Uh, I have FCS files. I have some other types of files mixed in, um, but this will have the data set that we're going to use today for analysis. And it's a pretty nice data set. It's a, you know, a immunophenotyping data set that has several um, uh, different patients and a different time course for each one of the samples. And it also includes compensation files. So it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty Pretty good data set, I think, to explore. So we'll use that. And um, I like to simply drag and drop the entire folder of data into the interface rather than going through and selecting the FCS files. You can just drag in the data file, the folder itself. And if you drag in a folder, you will notice that you will automatically create a group. So my folder name was immunophenotype data, and that's essentially what gets. Um, what gets added here, okay? And then all of your files will come in down below. You can sort these files by, you know, their name, ascending or descending. So if you double click again, you'll notice that this arrow is pointing either up or down to kind of indicate how you are sorting. But you can sort by other columns as well. Again, just by double clicking on that column, we can get the samples that have the most cells in them you know, going down to the least or vice versa. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the name because I like the way I have named my files and the order that they're presented. All right, after you have your files here, you will notice that there's three little icons that sit to the left of your files. You have sort of an open square or a gray grid. There's also a circle and then there's this sort of blue diamond. The open square or the gray grid is giving you information right up front. It's telling you whether or not your data files have a compensation matrix associated with those files. So my compensation controls, right, all the single stain controls here, you can see have an open square. There's no compensation matrix associated. And if I hover my mouse over the uh, square itself, you'll see the name of the file, and then it says compensation matrix none, meaning I have no compensation matrix associated with the files. But all of my test files and my fluorescence minus one controls here, when I hover my mouse over the gray grid there, it shows you the file name, and then it says compensation matrix acquisition defined. So it's telling me that I have a compensation matrix associated with my files, and that compensation matrix came from the cytometer that I acquired the data on. So that's what acquisition defined means, right? It came from the acquisition machine or how you acquired the data. Okay, so first things first, I normally will inspect the compensation data kind of as a first quality control inspection before I begin any type of analysis. So that's one of the first things that we're gonna do here. Let me just finish explaining the other um, the other uh, two icons here. So the circle icon is uh, opens up our inspect menu. This is kind of a cool menu in that on the left hand side it shows you a list. Right over here, it shows you a list of all of the metadata that are associated with your file. So in this case, I can see that this sample came from well A1. So I had run this in a plate, right? And then I can also see that I have some custom keywords that were added here. So for example, I have a PID. I have some information about the HIV status of the patient. I have an indication of whether or not the tube was stimulated. Um, I see the cytometer that it was acquired on and the date, et cetera, right? There's a lot of information about the files that's contained right here. So it's always a wise idea to inspect that um, if you're curious about, you know, when you run, ran the samples or which machine you would use to acquire them. The only thing I'll, uh, other than I'll say about this panel is that on the right-hand side at the bottom, you have these little graphs that are kind of useful 
um, they show you a plot that has um, a bunch of axes here labeled. So you have you know forward scatter area, forward scatter height, side scatter, and then all the various fluorochromes that I have in this experiment that are listed. Um, the y-axis is actually what is listed here. So uh, FSC would be on the y-axis. The x-axis is actually time. So we're looking at forward scatter versus time. Right here, we're looking at side scatter versus time, uh, AARD versus time, et cetera. And what you're looking for here is just to make sure that, you know, these, uh, the green line, the green line trace here sort of falls between these double dashed lines um, that are above and below it. And this is just a, a, an indicator, an immediate indicator of whether or not there was something going on with a cytometer when you began your acquisition. So if it had been warmed up, um, you should normally have a flat line here. If the machine wasn't quite warmed up when you started, you'll notice that the trend line starts out fairly, um, you know, fairly low, like down here someplace, and then it'll eventually, you know, it'll eventually level out. Uh, so anyway, it's just kind of a nice little pre-check to the data. We'll get into more detail about the quality control step there in a moment. Okay, and then the blue diamond is just showing you which menu or which graph window you have open um, in the forefront. So as I open different files, you'll notice that this diamond sort of floats around and goes to different places. All right, so first order of business is to inspect the, you know, do a little bit of quality control, right? So the first thing we're gonna do is inspect the compensation matrix that's on our data set. So the way I do that is I hover over the gray grid here and that will open up the matrix editor window. And then when I'm in the window here, I'm gonna close this little zoom window. But when I'm in the window here, you will see a bunch of things listed. So on the left-hand side, you have a list of the compensation matrices that you have in the workspace. So in this case, I only have one compensation matrix and that's the one that came from uh, or is attached to the data files currently. So that's the one that's labeled acquisition defined and the default color is always gonna be gray. Then you have a table um, in the middle at the top that has all the fluorochromes here and the um, compensation coefficients, the spillover table here um, into the various detectors, right? So each row is a fluorochrome and each column would be a detector. Um, and then I normally don't pay too much attention to that table, so I'll squish that. And then I will pay attention to the n by n plot that we have down below. So what you're seeing in this image is every two by two color combination. So I'm gonna zoom in here so that you can see the axes labels, right? So this first plot here, we are looking at uh, Alexa 700, the compensated parameter, right? Versus the compensated parameter for, uh, which happens to be plaque, PAC blue, right? So Alexa 700 versus PAC blue. Now you'll notice that within the plot itself, there are two colored, two sets of colored dots. Right. We have blue dots and then we have black dots. The blue dots represent the data that are raw, right? No compensation. If there was no compensation attached, that's what your data would look like. Where Wherever the blue dots fall, that's essentially what the data would look like. So if I actually move over a few plots, you will start to notice that there's some wonky looking blue dot images, right? We see these sort of banana shaped populations. Um, you know, curving in towards the center of our plots in some of these images. And in some of the other images, you will notice that we have these diagonals, right? The diagonal is a telltale sign that you have not done compensation. And usually, you know, anytime we have an experiment where we have two or more colors that have spectral emission overlap, we have to run compensation to figure out exactly how much uh, light is coming from one particular dye and spilling into a single detector um, versus all the other dyes that are in the experiment, right? So the classic example of dyes that have emission spectra overlap are FITSI and PE, right? FITSI spills over into PE a little bit and 
uh, will cause you to think that the cells that are, you know, really bright for Fitzy are also positive for whatever um, marker is on PE. But the reality is after we run compensation, a lot of times these diagonal populations will flatten out along either the X or the Y axes. And you'll notice that most of the cells here are not double positive. They're actually single positive for each one of the markers here. There's some double positives, but few in relation to um, you know, what we had in the beginning. So if you if you didn't do any compensation, you would say, oh, you know, everything here looks, you know, double positive. Uh, but in reality, when we, you know, do the compensation, right, the black dots represent the compensated data, we can see that they're actually single positive for those um, for those markers. Okay, so normally, I will toggle the uncompensated data off. And what I'll do is I'll go from one corner to the next, just slowly sort of perusing the, the files. And what I want to see here is I want to see that my single positive populations are parallel essentially to the y-axis, right? Or the x-axis. I don't want to see bending of these populations towards the middle, right? I don't want to see bending towards um, the Y or the X axis, right? Or hooking in that direction. I wanna see either straight lines or, you know, if this happens to fan out, it's okay to look like a trumpet, but uh, I want the middle of the trumpet to match the middle of the double negative population, okay? So the technical term here is to make sure that the medians of the single positive populations, if they're on the Y or along the X, the medians of either of these should match the medians of the double negative population, okay? So as I go through these data, I'll tell you right now, they look pretty clean. Whenever I have single positive populations moving in one direction or the other, there's very little bending, right? There's a little bit of bending here, but not much. Um, for the most part, that population is relatively parallel, right? Everything else looks pretty straight. So I'm not going to belabor the point here, but I do want to show you what a poorly compensated sample looks like so that you will understand what I'm talking about here rather than having to imagine it, okay? So here's an experiment that was compensated quite poorly. So even though you do compensation, if you don't do compensation correctly, if you don't Correct, collect the correct controls and you don't uh, obey the compensation rules, you're gonna get something that looks like this. So clearly we can see here, there's a population that is you know, bending off towards the left, right? This is, is hooking off towards the left, reaching into that X or Y axis. Uh, over here, same thing. You can see that this population is starting to fan out, but it's, fan out, it's fanning out and being skewed very strongly towards the left-hand side. Okay, over here, you also have a population that's reaching back, gonna crash into the, uh, into the Y axis, right? Same thing over here. And then down below, um, we see some other populations, right? Again, reaching back towards the X or um, the Y axis. Okay, so it's a good idea to quickly review the good rules for compensation since it's very important that you understand and learn these things before you begin doing a lot of your analysis. Okay, so the first rule for good compensation is making sure that your single stain controls, whenever you run a flow cytometry experiment, you need to have single stain controls for whatever those colors are that you're running in the, uh, in the experiment. So in my case here, we wanna make sure that our single stain controls are at least as bright or brighter than any of the test samples um, that are in the uh, in the data set. Okay, so the compensation matrix that you generate, those single stain controls have to be at least as bright or brighter than what you are testing in the experiment. This uh, rule, I have to say, about seventy percent of the time when I look at people's data, this is the rule that is broken probably seventy percent of the time. Okay. Uh, and people will complain, oh, my compensation doesn't look good, blah, 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 blah. Why did that happen? Well, most of the time it's, it's because you didn't follow rule number one. So this one is very important. They're all very important. Um, so the second rule here is making sure that the background fluorescence should be the same for the positive and negative control. So 
this means if you are running a flow cytometry experiment and you are using cells uh, to compensate for, let's say, the viability dye, and then for all the other colors, you're using beads, um, it means that you need to have you know, unstained cells as well as positively stained cells for that particular color. And then for all the remaining colors, if you're using beads, you just have to make sure that there are unstained beads um, to be matched up to the positively stained beads. And normally that's the case. When you buy compensation beads, normally the manufacturer has the, the peak that has the antibody bound, and then it has a peak that has no antibody bound. So there's, um, uh, you have both sometimes in one tube, okay? But if you wanna be 100% you know, sure, have an unstained tube of compensation beads. Okay, now the third rule is making sure that the comp controls match the exact experimental fluorochrome that you're using in the, um, in the experiment. So this is really important, especially if you have like transgenic mice that express uh, some transgene with GFP maybe attached to it or M cherry. Um, if you have a, maybe a cell line that expresses, uh, you know, GFP or M cherry or any of these other um, fluorescent proteins, you need to make sure that when you are running your compensation controls, you have to have cells that are expressing that particular fluorescent protein. So if you have transgenic mice in the experiment that have GFP, then you need to have, you know, some cells that have been transfected with a GFP plasmid as your compensation controls. Or you can, you know, get GFP that's attached to beads and use those. But the bottom line is use GFP to compensate for GFP. Do not use <clears throat> pardon me, Alexa 488 or, uh, you know, Fitzy to compensate for GFP. That will not work. Okay, so those are the three rules. The fourth rule that I haven't mentioned here is kind of hidden is good panel design. So you need to design a panel that matches with your machine, okay? Because uh, if you design a great panel where everything, all the colors are spread out, but the machine doesn't have the detectors or the lasers to excite those colors, um, then you're going to have some, definitely going to have some problems with your, uh, with your compensation and with your, your experiment. Okay, so let's go back to Flojo here and um, quickly figure out why this experiment turned out the way it did. Why did the compensation turn out this way? Well, I always recommend, if you have problems with your compensation, always overlay your single stain controls with one of the files, uh, one of the fully stained files. So I, I'll show you how to do this uh, a little bit later, but you can create these overlays, which are extremely powerful. And all I do is I've overlaid in each one of these images, I've overlaid the compensation control with the um, stained file. So the stained file in this case is represented in blue in all of the images and um, the single stain control is represented in red. Okay, so what I'm looking for in these images is to make sure that the blue is inside the goalposts essentially of the, the red goalposts. So as far as BB421 is concerned, the cells are good, they're inside the, the goalposts. And so it, you know, it, it passes. This compensation control is good because the cells here or the beads are brighter than the brightest bit of cells that are in the experiment, okay? Same thing here with BUV395. You can see that the cells and the beads are as bright as one another. This is okay. So long as the brightness of each is, is the same, okay? Or greater for the, uh, for the compensation control. Okay, so those first two are okay, but when we get to BV605, you will notice here that the cells are actually brighter than the compensation control. So in this case, we need to make a brighter compensation control or titrate down the antibody here that's on the, um, on the test files. You can see the background here is quite high, so I bet they didn't uh, titrate their antibodies either. Okay, PE, same thing. You can see that the cells are brighter than the compensation control, so this is a problem as well. Um, you need to make the PE, you know, in this case, they need to make their PE comp control 
at least somewhere out here, you know, between 10 to the fourth and 10 to the fifth. So they need to figure that one out as well. Okay. So in this case, the problem was that we did not have a comp control BV605, you know, and PE that were bright enough for the experiments. All right. So that's my example of poor compensation. The workspace that we're going to be working on today, compensation, as I mentioned, is pretty clean, so we don't have to do anything there. Last thing that I will show you to do uh, for quality control of the data is to just open up um, a graph window for one of your files. So in this case, I just opened it up on one of my test files. And I'm going to change the axis here. Instead of forward scatter, I'm going to change it to time. Okay, and then the y axis here, a lot of times it's good to put this, if you happen to have them, put this on the far red emitting dyes. So something like, you know, APC or APCH7, maybe Alexa 700, right? Doesn't matter. These guys all emit red light. And it sometimes is easy to see if there's any problems with the acquisition in that channel or series of channels, I should say. So in this case, what we're looking for is we're looking to make sure that the acquisition is even, the events are evenly distributed from left to right. Okay, so in these data, normally what I do is I just click the arrow key at the top, right? In these data, you can see that everything is pretty clean. There isn't a lot of um, problems with the acquisition. Everything is fairly smooth from left to right. So again, let me show you an example of a workspace that has a problem. Okay, so the types of things that can cause problems here are clogs or air bubbles. Clogs are very common because a lot of times we don't filter our samples or maybe our cells are really sticky. And so even if we do filter them, you know, when we bring them back to the cytometer, they're stuck to each other again. So what happens is we clog the system and what happens is in, within the system is the fluid expression changes and you get shifts in the spectra of the actual cells. So in the beginning here, you can see there's a lot of disruptions, right? It's not evenly distributed from left to right. There's a lot of jagged lines, et cetera. And then once you reach around the 20 second line or so, and you go off to the right, you can see that everything is pretty clean. So here you can see though, that there are within the clog, right? There's some cells that are shifted downward. Up here, you can see some cells are shifted Shifted upward, right, relative to the rest of the file. So if you do not clean the data and get rid of, you know, this, this junk in the beginning, you're going to find that you have some really bright, um, in this case, uh, CD192 positive cells that should not otherwise be there, okay? And so one of the things you can do is you can create a gate around the good stuff, and you can just call it time. And once you create that gate, you can double click on that and then just carry over, you know, only the good stuff that you want to deal with. Okay, there are some automated tools to help you with this as well. There's one called Flow AI, another one called Flow Clean, and a third one that we have, I haven't added it to this yet, is called Peacock. They're all published algorithms that um, help you to clean up clogs um, in your, uh, you know, in your data, and they'll do it automatically. And when they run, they will generate a bad events, right, and a good events um, population. So in this case here, you can see that I have bad events, right, on the one side, and then good events on the right side over here. And I can just use the good events population to begin my analysis. Okay, the way to get these tools is to go to the workspace tab, you go to the plugins drop down menu and you're going to click the very top option here that says Flojo Exchange. This takes you to our website where we have all of these tools. They're freely available. So all you have to do is download them. There's Flow AI. Um, if I scroll down maybe a little bit further, I will find um, Peacock. I like this icon. It has the Peacock feather. Um, but you can just download it here and follow the instructions on how to install it in your um, how to install it in your computer. 
Okay, so let's jump back to Flojo here. So that's a clog and what to do in the case you find a clog in the data set. So our data are pretty clean, so we don't have to worry about clogs in this data set either. Now, the next step that we want to um, take advantage of or next step that we want to do before we begin our analysis is just to make sure that our drop down menus here have a stain name associated with them. So a lot of times when I look at people's data, I will see that I'll see the fluorochrome that was acquired, or maybe I'll see the channel name, right? It'll say like FL1, FL2, blah, blah, blah. But it won't say what the marker was that they used for that particular fluorochrome or that particular channel, right? So in my case here, and a good example of this is if we look at the comp list here, you can see where it says comp AARD, and then there's nothing after that, right? If you didn't know what AARD was, you would not know that that's my viability guy. And so, you know, if I wanted to share my data with somebody, it would be wise to mark this so that they would know um, what I'm, you know, what I'm doing with this particular color. Okay, so. Let's see how to create a marker name on our AARD so that all of the samples here have that in their drop down menus. Okay, so what we need to do is make sure that we're on the all samples group because we want to add the name to all of the files in the workspace. And then what we can do is go to the configure tab at the top head over to the settings band, go to edit columns, right? This button over here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna scroll down just a little bit and you're gonna see a whole bunch of stuff that's labeled reagent here, okay? These are your fluorochromes. So you just pick out the one that you need to add the name to. You can pick multiple. If all of them are unnamed, you can select them all. Um, and then you say add column. So you have to make sure that it appears here on the right hand side and then you can click OK. And that will modify your workspace here so that it has this new column, right? And when I'm in this new column, I can now type what that is. So ARD is my viability die, right? I could call it live dead. I could call it whatever I want. Okay, once you have the name in there, you can go over to the workspace tab, and then you will notice the keywords band off to the right here. And within this, you will see an option to create this op this this choice here, where it says uh, copy value to group. Okay, and this will copy all of the information to all of the samples. So now, when I open up any of these files, it doesn't matter which one, you can see that AARD is labeled, right? And on my compensated files, not only can I see the uncompensated parameter has a viability attached, but the compensated parameter also has viability attached, okay? So it doesn't matter which one uh, you look at, they all now have that name. Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that after I've made my modification. I'll go back to that menu, I'll say remove column, and then that way it'll take it out of the uh, immediate interface, but it doesn't change anything, right? I still have the viability name here. So it's just a way of cleaning up my workspace. Okay, next thing we wanna do is we wanna group our files before we begin our analysis. As you can see here, I have single stain controls. I have fluorescence minus one controls, which we're gonna use as a gating um, a guide for uh, creating our gates. And then I have a series here of my um, test files, right? So what I'm gonna do is I am going to highlight the FMOs, right? So I just shift click to highlight them. I go back to the workspace tab and I'm gonna make use of the groups band here. There's a button that says group selected samples. So I select that and I'm gonna call this now my FMO group. Okay, when I do that, it creates a new ledger here in the workspace and it has seven files in it. Okay, and then the next thing that I'll do is I'll do the same thing with my test files because I, I want to put heat maps and things on them. So I'm gonna put them in their own group as well. So same thing, workspace, groups, group selected. Okay, and I'll just call this test. 
maybe make the color here. Instead of yellow, I'm gonna make it a little bit, you know, maybe like purple or pink. So it's easier for you guys to see when we start creating our analysis. All right, so now let's start gating our samples. I like to start with FMOs. Um, we have a series of FMOs here that will guide us um, in our gate creation. So this one has all of the colors except the color that we used for CD4. So until we get down to CD4, we, we can create gates. Okay, so the first thing that I'm gonna do, you don't have to worry about my hierarchy here because obviously your analysis is gonna be different than mine but I'm gonna create my lymphocytic gate first, right? And then from here, I'm maybe gonna do a doublet discrimination. So I'll pit the area versus the height parameters. And then I'm gonna go ahead and just create a gate that sort of follows this diagonal, right? All of the fuzzy stuff that's off towards the right here, these are gonna be do, uh, doublets. So we don't want to include those. And then I'm gonna double click on that. And I will probably now look at our, you know, viability die. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and make viability versus side scatter here. And again, I might use a rectangle or perhaps, a, you know, one of those odd shaped gates, the polygon gate here to make my live gate. Okay, so in any case, if you're, um, curious about it or haven't noticed, I should mention off on the um, off on the left hand side, I'm going to try and get these graphs kind of in order here so that I can show you what's going on. This is good. Okay, so you can see here that there is the first gate that I created is this one, right, the lymphocytic gate. And then I created after I created the lymphocyte gate, I double clicked somewhere inside that gate, I changed the axes, right, which gave me the single uh, single cells display, right, and then I double clicked on this and I created the live gate. That was the order of operations. And as you can see here, I have a hierarchy that is beginning to be made, right? So there's the ungated file, then I have my lymphocytic gate, right? The single cells gate is dependent on the lymphocytic gate, that's what the indentation means here. Okay, and then the live gate is dependent on the position of not only the singlets gate, but it's also dependent on the lymphocyte gate. So you can display this just by simply moving the upstream gate to a different location, and you can see how it affects the populations downstream, right? If I go over here, you will notice that we have quite a bit of doublets Right. Oftentimes, the stuff that's smashed up against the axis there are going to be doublets. And of course, we're going to have very few cells that are um, falling in that category that are, well, it could be live. The problem is this singlet gate was off. Okay, but it influences all the other ones. All right, now let's continue our analysis here. So we're going to go from live and then we're going to go split our lineages. So we'll go CD3 versus HLA-DR. So in this particular experiment, I'm, per I'm interested in the T cells, particularly the CD8 T cells, and I want to see whether or not, you know, they express some readout markers for my stimulation. So the first thing that I'm going to do here is isolate my CD3s um, after, of course, I've cleaned up the data. So here we have a situation where the data look a little bit squished. It's easy enough to create a gate here, but why not, you know, make more use of the white space on either side of these graphs to stretch things out and to make it easier to see, okay? So in order to rescale the data, we're gonna click the T button and then we're gonna come down here where it says customize axis, right? And then this will open up a new window that has like a histogram on it. And it's in this window that you can play around with the numbers here, the scaling, right? We can add or subtract um, logarithmic, you know, decades here. So I could subtract it, for example, to get rid of a lot of that white space. I could also enter in manual values if I wanted to do that. You can change the type of scale. So by default here, we're on by X, but you can go to straight log or linear. You can also do several other um, types as well. Okay, I'm gonna do something like this. If I wanna play with the negative end of the scale, I use the width basis controller, 
All right, and if I get too many cells pressed up against the axis, I can always use this extra negative decade slider, which will bring those events off, right? And again, I don't want to do this too much because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to introduce too much white space. I want to make use of the white space. So we're going to go ahead and leave it at something like that. There's still a little bit of white space here that I could probably, you know, eat up. But in the interest of time, that'll be good enough for us. Now I'm going to do the same thing to the Y axis. So I'm going to click the T button, go to customize and give it a couple clicks there, maybe blow up the area around zero and then pull this off and then click apply. And now you can see, right, these data are a lot easier to isolate or to gate on than the previous, right? So don't hurt your eyes, just make it, you know, easy to see so that it is easy to gate. And then, you know, you make your life a lot easier. I'm gonna use quadrants here. You could have done anything that you wanted, you know, use a rectangle, use a polygon, use an ellipse, whatever you want. I like the rectangle, so I'm gonna use that. Or sorry, not the rectangle, but the, um, the quad gates. Okay, and then from there, I'm gonna go ahead and double click on the third quadrant, which happens to have our CD3 positives, right? These are our T cells. So once I, <laughs> pardon me, once I have the T cells in place, I can start to subdivide them along their major lineages, right? Like CD4s and our CD8s here, okay? Now here you can see, again, this is an FMO. So it has all of the dyes or all of the colors except CD4 in it. That's why you don't see anything here. There's a little bit of carryover, but other than that, it's empty. And this, what this does is it allows us to quickly create a CD4 positive gate. Now we know where the exact bound is here because we have accounted for essentially all of the other dyes um, being present, okay? So there's our CD4 gate. Um, and now if I want to preview this CD4 gate on all the rest of my files, you can see that the rest of the files here do not have any gates on them. And if I try to advance, it's all grayed out here at the top. So I can't actually do that until I copy this information to the rest of the samples. Okay, so the fast way to do this in Flojo is to simply block highlight the gates that you wanna copy. And then what I recommend that you do here is you right click and you say copy analysis to group. Okay, and then that will transfer all of the gates to the group. And as you can see here, all of the other samples pick up those gates, and now they have this kind of green color associated with them. Now I can advance to different samples to see what that CD4 gate looks like on all those other samples. Okay, so if you happen to copy that gate over, and let's say you I don't know, you accidentally move it to another location and you don't like that location. You want the gate to essentially snap back to where it is on all of the other samples that you have, right? All these guys are in the same spot, but this one is in the wrong spot. Okay? All you have to do is highlight the gate that has changed. So in this case, the way you can identify that is you will see that the gate that has changed position is presented to you here with a kind of a black uh, plain font type, right? Whereas the rest of your group, those gates are in green, right? And kind of like a bold color. So this is telling you that this gate has changed relative, like has changed its position relative to the rest of the other gates that are in this group. So if you want this gate to go back to, you know, where it was before, you select the gates in the hierarchy, and then you just hit the delete key, and that will snap the gate back to where it wants to go or where it ought to be. Okay, so again, you highlight the black gate, hit the delete or the backspace key on your keyboard, and that will snap this back to its original position. 
Okay, now let's take the opposite situation. Let's say that you nudge the gate, you move it off towards the right or something, and you're like, this is supposed to be the new position. I'm exaggerating here because I want you guys to see that I have moved it. Okay, not that we would do this, but let's say you want to nudge the gate or move the gate to some other location and make this gate the new gate's position. Okay, well, you can, the easy way again is go back to the gate that has the black sort of highlight or the black, uh, the black color and right click on that gate and do the same thing here. Copy analysis to group, okay? And when you do that, you get a prompt here saying that it already exists. Do you wanna replace it? You just say yes. And that will update that gate's position for all of the other samples. Okay, now that gate's position was inappropriate. So I'm gonna move it back here, right? And again, you can see that it's black. So I have to update everybody else by saying copy analysis to group, go through the warning. And now you can see that it's updated for all the other samples. Okay. So while I'm at it, I'm going to go ahead and just create a CD8 gate here on the CD8 positive cells. And then I'll show you again what we're going to do here, right? So we have this CD8 gate. We're going to go ahead and simply copy it to the group, right? And then maybe we're going to investigate the CD8 T cells. Um, to look to see whether they've been activated or not, right? So I'm gonna change the x-axis now to some of the readout markers like interferon, for example. Okay, interferon has a pretty good on-off you know, expression here, but I happen to have an FMO for this particular color. So I'm gonna ride with the FMO to make my decision. So I'm gonna just scroll forward until I find the FMO that has no interferon. So that's this guy. And then what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna create a gate on what I consider the interferon positives, okay? You can see here that I have my interferon gate and then I'll go ahead and right click here, say copy analysis to group. And now everybody picks up that gate. Okay, so I see there's a question in the chat box. I would just take a second here to read it. It says, can you please repeat how you got the gate to snap back to the original position? Yes. So once you have copied the gates to the group, in my case, right, we copied everything over. And in fact, I just copied the interferon gate to the group. But now if I nudge it, right, or I move it, it doesn't matter how severely you move it. The fact is it's in some other position other than the original. Now what you do is you highlight that gate, the one that has changed. And the way you can tell whether it has changed or not is because the color here in the workspace is black versus, in my case, the green. But your group may be a different color. It might be blue, it might be red, it might be orange, whatever. The point is, if you have this black font type, that's the gate that has changed. And so what you do here is you click the delete or the backspace key on your keyboard. It'll give you a warning usually saying, you're about to delete this gate, whatever. Just say yes, and it will snap the gate back into its original position. Okay, so that's what I'm doing here. I'm highlighting and then hitting the delete key, right? moving it over, highlight, hit the delete, and it snaps it back into its original position. Okay, so that's interferon. Let's do a couple of others, like maybe perforin, right? Here's another good example of why we should have FMOs in our experiments. Perforin is a smeared marker, kind of like you know, CD14, for example. And it's hard to tell where the boundary between positive and negative is. So just use your FMO. That was it right there, perforin, right? No perf to create the, you know, perf positive if you want. Right? You can create that gate just to know where that boundary happens to be. Okay. And then I go back. I usually use this blue diamond to kind of identify which gate I just created. I find my perforin positive gate and I do the same thing here. I copy analysis to group. 
Okay, and then from here, we will do the last readout marker, phospho -ERC, another one that is difficult to identify the boundary between positive and negative. So we're gonna use the FMO. So I'm just gonna scroll here until I find no phospho -ERC sample. And that's what I have here. So I'm gonna go ahead and create this gate. And I'm gonna call this p erc positive, right? And I'm going to create a catch all here for everybody. Then I go back to my workspace. I find my new gate, right click here, copy analysis to group. Okay, so once that's done, we probably want to add some statistics. A lot of times we want MFIs for different populations. Let's assume for a second that I want the MFIs of all of my readout populations. So what I can do is I can highlight the population I want the MFI for, and then I can right click on it. And then there's an option in the right click menu to say add statistic. All right, so we're gonna come here. Now, normally in flow cytometry data, we're either gonna use the median or the geo mean to describe the MFI. We normally don't use the mean because the data are plotted on a logarithmic scale, right? So. When you have data here, let me just change the axis out to something that has some data in it, right? If you were to use the mean, the mean would be heavily skewed towards the right or the left if you had outliers, right? It's very heavily skewed by that. But the median and the geo mean are better at telling you where this ball, the bulk of the ball of cells happens to be, right? So in the case of the median, half of the cells are above the line, the other half are above the median line. The geo mean is calculated differently, but it's you know equivalent to the root of the product of all of the um, fluorescence intensities of all the, the data points that you have here. Okay, so in any case, if you want them both, you can add them both or all, whatever the, you know, whatever you want to do here. Uh, but I'm going to highlight both the median and the geo mean, and then you just match it up to a color. So in our case here, we're matching it up. We're getting the MFI just for interferon. You could, you know, highlight other fluorochromes as well. You get little stat nodes here underneath the population that you wanted it for. Okay, and then you don't have to close out of this. You can actually just choose another population and essentially do the same thing. Let's say we want the geo mean and the median for phospho -ERC. So you just change the population, change the color, click add. We'll go and do that for perforin as well. We just change the population and we change the color and then click add. And then it goes ahead and adds all that stuff for us. Okay, and then the way we treat this is the same like we do for gates. You kind of have to highlight around the copied stuff because the control shift G or my little special trick here, copy analysis to group, doesn't work if you highlight gates that have been copied. Okay, so you say copy analysis to group and now all of the other samples pick up those statistics, okay? And all of the FMOs. All right, now what we wanna do is we wanna transfer all of this information that we have on the FMOs over to the test files, right? Because the test files don't have any gates on them yet, just the fluorescence minus one controls. So the easy way to do this is to simply block highlight your uh, gates that are in the FMO group. And then what you can do is you can just simply drag and drop them onto the test group. Okay, and when you do that, you will notice that we get the high, you know, the hierarchy all transferred over as well as the uh, statistics. Okay, and I'll show you guys a nice little advanced tip here. I'm just gonna quickly close all graph windows to clean up my workspace, um, but then I'm gonna open up a few others, right? So maybe we wanna look at this, and maybe we wanna look at this with, um, bah, 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 bah. let's take a look at, let's make it interferon, for example. Okay, if you wanna just do a quick perusal of, a couple of graphs side by side like this. If you hold down the shift key and then click the green right or left arrows, 
both graphs will update at the same time and we can kind of cycle through our samples to see you know how well uh the um you know the cells are essentially responding to our stimulus so for example in this tube right ld12 this is actually the 20 minute uh, time point you can see there are not very many interferon positive cells but when I advance to the next tube, which is the one hour time point for the same patient, you can clearly see that there's a bunch of interferon being dumped here. Okay, so that's a quick advanced trick to, to apply if you want, but I prefer to use something called the layout editor to make my comparisons. Okay, so click on the L button here. This will open up the layout editor. And again, this is where we go to create our figures, but we can do a lot of other things like we can create overlays. We can do some analysis here as well. So it's a very powerful interface within, the, uh, within Flojo proper. Normally what I'll do when I work in the layout editor is I like to work just with my populations. I don't like to have the statistics floating around. So I'll give you an example of what I mean by this. If I drag and drop my interferon population, you'll notice that the plot appears, but then I also have these like floating statistics. Sometimes people want them, most of the time I don't want them, I want them in a table. So I, I will normally hide the stats while I work in the um, layout editor. So I'm gonna come over here. I just quickly go to the configure tab and I say hide stats. Right, I'm configuring the interface and I'm configuring it in this case to get rid of the statistics just temporarily, right? It's just a toggle switch. Once you've added them, you can hide them. Okay, so I'm hiding them and now I'm gonna bring in my other terminal populations, right? Maybe I wanna look at phospho -ERK and perforin as well, okay? So a lot of times when we work in this you know layout editor especially with lots of plots you know we'll have a situation like this where the plots are sort of misaligned um you know there's different amount of space between them there are some tools here to help you arrange them so for example underneath the arrange tab you can arrange top right and then you can align the spacing here so that they're all evenly spaced um, you can play around with those tools it's kind of cool um you know if if uh, if you have the time and if you want to. My, my preference is to use another tool to quickly align my graphs. I use this one here called the grid tool. So if you click on the grid, you click and drag here. So Flojo kind of gives us a little bit of license to, you know, show you kind of what we like as application scientists. This is something that I would use back in my postdoc and grad school days. So you just click and drag and um, it creates a grid for you. And again, that button is literally right here. It's kind of hard to see, but when you hover your mouse, you will see that it says grid. Um, you can modify the grid so that you can add more columns or more rows, right? So you get this little prompt, you can add multiple. I'll just add another one so that we now have a four by four square, but you could do three by three, you know, two by six, whatever you want. Um, and then what I like to do is I like to just take my, um, you know, all of my plots and I just drop them somewhere off of the grid, right? And then what you can do is you can drag them into um, the grid, sort of that upper left corner, and they will occupy um, all of the, uh, the, you know, the grid spots. And now this way, I don't have to align my um, I don't have to align my plots, right? They're all evenly spaced. They're all aligned um, properly and I don't have to, you know, to worry about it. If I have to come in and change a plot, you can always just double click on that um, square that has uh, the plot that you need to change. And you can come here and, uh, you know, just change the axes. So let's say we would rather look at forward scatter uh, versus, you know, time and whatever else we were looking at. So we'll do forward and side scatter. You click OK, and it'll change that plot out, right? And then from here, if you don't like the black grid lines, which I normally don't care for either, 
Um, I will go over to the object tab and then I just click on the line drop down menu and you can see here that you can change this so that it has no line and then that way it looks nice and pretty right and if we wanted to make we could make a figure out of this if we wanted to right it looks it looks pretty good now once you have this you probably want to see what this looks like across all other files okay there's a couple of ways you can do that in the layout editor you can either you know iter change the iteration options here this is the easiest way in my opinion or actually it's not the easiest way but this is the way that's going to save your your computer's ram so if you change the iteration options to sample here you will see that now there's a drop down menu that will allow you to advance to whatever sample you want to and you have these arrow keys as well so you can kind of you know click through and see how they all change you know sample to sample if you'd like okay and if you want to go nuclear which is the easiest option here which is just to click the batch button i'm going to put this in a single column going down but if you click the batch button this is going to chew up a significant amount of your um, computer's RAM, so I would be careful in doing it. And as you can see here, my system is slowing down significantly to uh, to produce this report. But when you click this button, right, it shows you that same set of tiles or the same set of plots, right, for not only the first patient right for the let's say the zero time point but then we have a 20 minute time point we have a 60 minute time point then we have a two hour time point right so on and so forth until we get to the next patient and this goes and goes and goes until we get done with all 20 files that we have okay now the cool thing about this is that you can see everything at once the downside is it eats up a decent amount of ram and the reason that it eats up ram is because this is not a static image you can do backgating from here, right? So again, if we kind of go back to our forward and side scatter here, if I happen to move this gate, you can see how it affects, right? All of the other populations that we have downstream of it, okay? And it only did it in this case for that particular file. All the other ones are still in place. And again, if I want to return this gate back to where it was before, I just hit the delete key. It snaps that gate back. And then you notice that all of my stuff is restored here. Okay, so pretty powerful. It just, it eats up a decent amount of RAM. So I normally don't use that option unless, um, you know, I'm on a pretty beefy computer or, you know, I know that uh, what I'm putting on it is not too demanding. All right, from here, what I wanted to uh, what I wanted to show you guys as well is that um, you not only can batch to, you know, Flojo proper, right, but you can create PowerPoints, right? So you can just batch to PowerPoint, you can batch to PDF. My favorite option is to batch to printer, and I'll show you why, right? If we click the batch button here, what ends up happening is your print spooler will um, your print spooler will pop up, and then there are several choices that become available to you um, in that print spooler menu that wouldn't otherwise be um, available. So we'll wait here a second or two to see what happens with the option for um, for our print spooler. So I apologize, it's taken a little while. I probably got a little, you know, I'm being a little bit aggressive with the, uh, you know, with the batch reports here. So it's taking a little, taking its time to show me my print spool menu, but there it goes. So the cool thing about the print spool menu when you batch to printer, right, is that you can retile the data here so that you can have it in, you know, two per page, right, so many rows, so many columns, whatever you want to do here. And then when you go to click print, 
you have the option to save it here as a PDF, right? So you kind of get three things in one. You get the hard copy, you also get the PDF, and you get to retile, um, you get to retile the data, okay, within that and how it's going to be um, promoted. Um, now let's imagine that, let's say that uh, you only, you know, you don't want the full report, you just need it for an exemplary patient, right? Let's click our drop down menu and let's just say that patient number 12, the one hour time point is the exemplary, um, you know, sample. And this is what we want to use for a figure in a, in a paper. What we need to do here is rather than create a batch report where we're gonna get everything, um, we just wanna you know, export this image, right? Or series of plots, right? As an image of some kind. So you click on the file tab, you go to export image, and you can see here that you have several image format types to spit out. So PDF and TIFF are probably your best bet because those are the high resolution. Um, also SVG is really good because you can ungroup the objects in uh, Adobe Illustrator, for example, um, using an SVG. Um, but the other image types here, the bitmaps, these are fairly low resolution, good for you know email or presentation, but not really for papers, right? For publication, manuscripts, you want to use either PDF, SVG, or TIFF. Okay, and you just select that option, and it will uh, give you a prompt to say where you want to save it, and it'll give it a name, and uh, you can you can then fetch it at a later um, a later time. All right, so let's do one last thing in the layout editor here because I know that you guys are going to want to do um, you're going to want to do this. I know that I want to do this, right? So. Normally, when we have readout populations like this, we want to see how does, you know, how do these readouts change over the course of time? And maybe how do they change? Do they change from patient to patient, right? I have four or five different patients and I have four different time points. So I want to include all that information um, in a, you know, in an overlay, essentially. So the way you can do this, there's a couple of ways you can create the overlay. It's pretty simple. Let's start with interferon. So what I can do for interferon is I can just, you know, scroll down to the next sample and I can highlight it here and just drag and drop it into the work uh, layout editor. And then I can dump that graph. You can kind of see that, it, you know, when I'm threatening to put it on top of that graph, you see the blue border. Right. If I drop it, it will start to create our overlay. We'll get a legend. And now you can see the samples now are represented by two different colors. I can come back to the workspace here, select the next sample, drag and drop it in, and then go to the fourth one that represents my two hour time point and do the same thing, drag and drop it. And now I have all four time points overlaid with one another. Okay, so that's one way that you can do it. Another way to create an overlay, this is my favorite, is to simply right click and say select equivalent nodes. What this does is it highlights all of the phospho ERCs that I have in the data set. And then what I can do is I can just simply drag and drop that onto the plot that I have um, in the uh, layout editor. Okay, now I must have not targeted it and it didn't do it the first time. I'm gonna move this plot over. So let me move this guy real quick. And then I'm gonna zoom back in so that I can show you what I'm doing here. Now, in this case, the way I did it, I create this massive overlay, okay? Which is not what I want. I want to just represent patient number one. I don't want patient two, patient four, patient 12 or 14. But in my opinion, it's a little bit easier to just, you know, clean up the legend here. All you have to do is block highlight or shift click inside the legend. And then you simply right click here and say remove layer and that will get rid of all of the extraneous information. If you do it my way, you will get duplicate representation of the first file. So you can go ahead and also remove that duplicate. And now you have an overlay just like 
the one we did for interferon. So if you have multiple files that you want to overlay, maybe my method is the way you want to go. If you just have, you know, two or three, you probably can just do the drag and drop and that'll get you there um, fast enough. I'm going to go with perforin for the this one and I'll do it the way I did it before, right? Select equivalent nodes and then I just simply drag and drop those nodes onto the plot that I have in the layout editor. And then I clean up my legend here, selecting everything that is not patient number one. I right click and say remove, right? Right click and say remove. And there I go. Okay, now let's uh, change these plots, right? We probably don't like to look at the overlays as dot plots. Might be better to look at these as histograms. So I'm going to highlight all three of the plots, double click, and then I'm going to change the plot type here to histogram. And then if you want down here, you can change the scaling. I like to do this a lot. Whenever I have overlaid histograms, put this on modal. And then this will show essentially samples that have very few cells in them. They will look similar to the ones that have uh, abundance cell populations in them. So we click OK, and then that will change our graphs into histograms. Now, last step that we want to do here is we want to offset these histograms, right? So what we want to do here is right click on the histogram and change it. So we right click and we get this really long menu. We come down to the bottom where it says histograms. And what we want to do here is we want to say offset, right? Full offset, no peaks, you know, are overlapping. If we do uh, another one on this side, we could do a half offset. You can see how the peaks overlap with one another. And then the last one I'll show off here is the stagger offset. This one has this little blue corner that you can play around with. So you can stretch the graph out, right? You can make it look really quite exaggerated relative to um, you know the other plots. Probably not as useful, but nonetheless, it looks pretty cool. So we have um, we have this set up. And now um, if I want to create the batch report, right? I want to see this report so that I can see what does this look like for not only patient number one, but I want to see patient two, patient you know, 12, patient 14, et cetera. How do I get that to happen if these options are grayed out? Okay, all we need to do is march next door. You can see here where it says iterate by and it says off. So what I want to do here is I want to click the option that says panel. So anytime you have more than one sample overlaid on top of one another, you want to choose panel. It's the easiest way to do it. And then tell it how many samples you have overlaid. So in this case, we had four. You will notice that my batch button now turns green again. And I can go ahead and create the full batch report. So I'll go ahead and create the report here so that you guys can see what the outcome uh, is okay. So here we see obviously we're looking at patient number one, all three graphs, no big deal. That's what we started with. But if we scroll down, we can see there's patient number two with all their time points, right? And then if we go down further, we see that that's patient number four, right? And then we get to patient 12, and then ultimately we get to patient 14. Okay, so hopefully you guys find that helpful. So it shows I've shown you how to do sort of single sample, right, kind of review, as well as what if I have a multi-graph, like an overlay that I want to check out. Okay, another cool feature in, you know, this uh, layout editor is you have this uh, end by end plot. You have some other plot types that you can use here, but end by ends are super cool, right? Because what you can do here is you can do a little bit of backgating um, to see where, you know, for example, where does my, uh, you know, in this case, interferon positive population, where does it lie across, you know, all other colors, or maybe in the context of, let's say, my lymphocytic, I don't know, population. So you can create an overlay here um, with that N by N plot. 
This I also use this plot quite frequently when I have problems with compensation and I want to see how do those extra bright cells affect my data. And you'll normally notice that the curved populations are um, the curved populations are the ones that are brighter than the compensation control. Okay, but this can be helpful for identifying, you know, rare populations of cells or whatever. And you, obviously you can modify this, uh, you know, what is shown here um, by right clicking on the panel itself. And you can either untick, you know, a box or add one to it um, to see, you know, how the cells look for each of those parameters. Super cool. Just a lot of things that you can do here. I don't have time to, to cover them all, but those should be the major ones, okay? Now, <clears throat> last step in our analysis is usually to do the table editor. So I'm gonna open up the um, table editor, which is the screen looking guy. This is where we go to uh, add our uh, statistics. Right, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to toggle my statistics back on and I'm going to go ahead and, you know, take these stat nodes and I'm going to drag them into the table editor. Now, I, I didn't explain it before, but you notice that there is a statistic column and a cells column in Flojo by default, right? So the statistic column, when it's referencing a uh, a population. So as you see here, you know, the third quadrant, or if I look at my live cells, you see this number that says 96.3. What does that mean? This means that the live cells are 96.3% of the single cells population, right? And the single cells population are 99.8% of the lymphocytes, right? And then the lymphocytes are 86% of the total. Okay, so the frequency statistic or the statistics that always is here is the frequency of the parent. You can always add, you know, a frequency. Maybe I want to know what the frequency of the interferon is relative to, let's say, the singlets, right, or the live cells by simply, again, adding the statistic. You say frequency of blank. You tell it what population you want it for. I could say, okay, well, I'm interested in knowing what those are as a total of the lymphocytes, you click add, close this, and it'll tell you here. Now this value is 0.7, right? So it's telling you that my interferon positives are 0.7% of the lymphocytic population. Okay, we can use this guy as well. So let's just go ahead and copy that to the group and we'll drag that in. Now, if you're gonna report, if you want frequencies, you just have to drag in the population. And that's always gonna take this statistic that's right here, the frequency of the parent. Okay, so if you want any other frequency, add the statistic here first, copy it to the group and then drag it over. Don't come here and double click, you know, then go, well, oh, I don't want that statistic. I want this statistic, right? If you come in here and do that, it's gonna take you a long time. Because now you have to go through one by one and click. Just add the statistic here, copy it to the group, and then drag the statistic into the table editor. And you only have to do it for one file, right? Because the batch button takes care of it for us for all of the other files. All right. So once I'm here, I like to create a, you know, highlight the 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 samples like so I do a control a and then I'll normally like click on the visualize tab here and do a heat map so that when I get my table the table is heat mapped All right so the minute you click heat map you get this little fireball then you click on the you know batch button which is that little green cog in the upper right and you will notice that I get my table, each one of the columns here has the names of the statistics, right, that I'm using. Okay, and you can always double click on any of these columns to see what's high, what's low. You can double click on the name, file name column here to rearrange them how they are by default. And you can do control C, control V directly into Excel. If you want, you can also save the file here. So you just click on File, Save As, Text or CSV. I recommend you use CSV. Okay, and then 
If you want, you can set your table editor, or sorry, you can set your tables next to your plots. So you can change the display options here and you can say, oh, I want it to go to my current layout. So it'll come over here and it'll give you a warning that the table is static. So if you choose, if you move a gate or something, these numbers will not update. So you need to rebatch the table. That's why I always make the table the very last uh, step in my analysis. Okay, so hopefully that's been clear. Um, I wanted to talk to you guys about how to do compensation in Flojo just in case. Um, so a lot of us do compensation on the machine, which is really nice. But Flojo has a number of algorithms that you can use to compensate your data differently than you would on the machine. So, you know, you never know. Sometimes these uh, algorithms might be uh, useful at resurrecting, you know, problematic data, for example. They, the auto spill algorithm that we have, for example, is a little bit more forgiving when you have comp controls that are, um, well, they still have to be as bright as whatever you have in the test file but you actually don't have to have as many bright cells or as many bright beads uh, as you normally would. And I'll show you how to do that as well. So if we come to the compensation wizard here, uh, or sorry, the compensation group, we're gonna click on the comp wizard, just make sure all your files are here. You click on the M and then the window will appear, okay? so. As I mentioned, there's several different ways for you to compensate here. There's the traditional method of compensation, which most of you are used to. You can do spectral unmixing. So you can tick the box over here if you are acquiring your data on a spectrally enabled machine. So for example, BD has like a symphony, I think it's an A5, we have a symphony A3 that are spectrally enabled machines. There's probably more that I'm not aware of in the BD portfolio. Um, we probably all heard of SciTech. They have the Aurora that is a spectral en uh, spectrally enabled machine as well as Sony. Sony has an ID, I believe it's the ID 7000. Um, but in any case, these are all machines that have, you know, a multitude of detectors that are left open. Um, compared to the number of colors that you're running. Most cytometers that are not spectrally enabled, um, the number of colors that you have is equal to the number of detectors. Okay, so that's the main um, difference between sort of, you know, spectral unmixing and then just doing compensation the regular, um, the regular way. And then the nice thing here too, is if you're acquiring spectrally um, if you're acquiring spectral data, you can do, not only can you do linear least squares, which is the default spectral algorithm that's used, but you can also do a weighted least squares, which is this optimize weights button. If Again, if you're using a spectral uh, machine or collecting spectral data. Okay. In our case, these data were acquired 10 years ago. So the machines at that time were not spectrally enabled. Um, these machines, you know, it was pretty much one detector and one, like it was a one-to-one -one ratio, right? I have, in this case, let's say nine colors. So I would have nine detectors. So the tr I'll cover the traditional method first, and then we can quickly cover the auto spill after that. And as I said, auto spill can be kind of forgiving if you have, especially if you have cells as your compensation controls. So that might be worthwhile. And the nice thing too about auto spill is that if you have highly autofluorescent cells, you can actually use auto spill to subtract out the autofluorescence. Um, but you will have to have a detector on the machine left open to detect the autofluorescence of those cells. And it should be um, it should be in the frequency that the cells are most autofluorescent in. Okay, so here we go. Um, we'll start with traditional. And in this case, um, what is being shown to you here is on the left-hand side, all the fluorochromes are listed. And then all the single stain controls for those fluorochromes are listed in the sample column. Okay, and then Flojo goes a step further. It tries to assign a negative, right? So for each color, 
we have to have a negative or an unstained population. And then we obviously have to have a positively stained population, right, for each color. So that's essentially what's being represented in these two columns. So the negative, a lot of times um, what Flojo does is it uses a universal negative. So in this case, it finds your, my unstained cells and it uses that for all of my fluorochromes. Okay, but that's not appropriate for a lot of my fluorochromes because you can see here that a lot of my fluorochromes are actually, we're using beads to compensate. We're not using cells. So in order to satisfy the autofluorescence rule, remember how the autofluorescence of beads and cells is different. We need to match the autofluorescences of the positive and the negative, okay? so. I am going to go through each one of these files and I'm going to swap out the, um, the negative to be the appropriate type. Um, but if Flojo got, you know, the universal negative wrong, um, maybe you want to use a different universal negative. Um, you can obviously find that one, take the cleanup gate, which is usually called size, and then dump it into the negative column here. And then what you'll see is we now have unstained beads, right, for the negative and all of these instead of um, unstained cells. So again, this is still not appropriate, especially for a couple of colors. Here I'm using cells again for the positive, right? I'm using cells for the positive over here. So I need to make some, um, I need to make some adjustments. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is make sure that I'm using unstained cells for AARD. So I'm just going to click on a negative here, and I'm going to go ahead and say, I want to use unstained cells. Okay, good. I have an unstained tube, unstained tube of cells. There they are. Now, um, for the positive, you can kind of see in the middle plot, um, this is an overlay between the, the left-hand side and the right-hand side. So within this, this, this size gate here, Flojo takes the cells that are here, dumps it here takes these cells over here, dumps it here, and then each is represented by either a blue histogram or a green histogram. A little bit easier to see on this one, right? Here you can see that the negative coming from this bead, right? And then this positive histogram is in green is coming being derived from this bead gate. Okay, so here we have completely overlapping histograms. We don't see any dead cells. We, you know, this would be a really poor compensation control. So what we need to do is we need to change the uh, placement of this gate. We need to move this gate into an area where we'd expect to find some dead cells. So I'm going to move that around until I find some. And in this case, the 10 or 11 o'clock position is good. You can see here that I have uh, some dead cells appear all of a sudden, right? And the range gate kind of moves to accommodate that. Okay, now again, remember that the autofluorescence of the cells, right, of the, of the negative and the positive should be the same. So usually it's a good idea, especially on dead cells, to make sure that you also place your negative gate in a similar area. You're placing it on dead cells, but again, these are dead cells that have not been stained, right? And you can see here that the autofluorescence actually does increase a bit. So um, now the autofluorescence of this guy and the autofluorescence of this guy are matched, and that will drop out of the equation when it comes to calculating the compensation matrix. Okay, so that fixes that parameter. Now look at the other ones. Okay, I have beads on the left, beads on the right. That's okay, that looks good. We have good separation. Same thing here, Alexa 488. We have beads on the left, beads on the right. Um, this is an interesting one, Alexa 647. We didn't actually, um, we had this detector left open, but we didn't actually stain here with Alexa 647. So there's no antibody to this. We didn't use this particular fluorochrome. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dump Alexa 647 all together. So I go up here, I find the sample, and I say, just remove this parameter. Okay, and then that will dump Alexa 647 from um, the, the list. And now we go on to Alexa 700. Okay, here's another instance where we have beads on the left and cells on the right. So I want to make sure that I'm using unstained cells. So the first thing I'm going to do is find Alexa 700. I follow this across to the negative, and I just say, look, buddy, 
you need to be using unstained cells here. Okay, that's good. Um, but again, with the autofluorescence, right, we want it to be the same. You can see that there's a gate here that's on the, you know, on the lymphocytic population. Um, but the gate on the negative is on the dead cells. So what I want to do is I want to copy this gate that I have here and I want to place it over here. Okay. And the way that we do this is by simply going back to the workspace. And what we're going to do is find that Alexa 700 sample. And I'm just going to find the cleanup gate. It's always called size. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to simply rename that gate and I'm going to call it something like, we'll just call it cleanup, right? That's a good name for it. Okay, and then I'm gonna take that cleanup gate and I'm gonna add it to the unstained sample. I'm just gonna, I'm just basically copy pasting it, right? Onto the unstained sample. So now when I go to the wizard, you can see that I have both gates represented. Okay, and now all I have to do is tell Flojo, hey, for Alexa 700, please use the cleanup gate rather than the size gate. So we just scroll down here, we see unstained cells cleanup, now we know Flojo is using this guy rather than this one, okay? And now that means that these two autofluorescences are matched up, okay? And then sometimes, I'm not sure why, but the wizard puts the gate in such a way that it encompasses the negative population. And this has the effect of dragging the median down. As you can see, that little dashed line that's going uh, horizontal or sorry, vertical through your um, plot here is moved towards the left. But the minute I, you know, move this gate over into a more appropriate location, you see that it gets brighter. And that's essentially what you want. All right, so now we just need to inspect all the other um, parameters. They look good, good separation. The autofluorescences are matched, right? We have beads on the left, beads on the right, okay, unstained beads here. All right, and now we can just call this, I don't know, we can call this matrix our traditional matrix, right? Something like that. Click on view matrix, and this is gonna create a new compensation matrix for you. I'm gonna zoom out here so that you can see it. Okay, if you want to compare this matrix to the one that you did on the machine, you can always highlight it here. It'll actually subtract one table's values versus the other. I mean, you can see here there's minor differences between what I did here versus what I did on the machine. And that's because I have a little bit more time and I can fiddle around with the gates a little bit you know, differently in Flojo than I can while I'm on the machine. Usually on the machine, I'm a little bit rushed. Okay, but here you can see that, you know, the red dots and the gray dots, right? The red dots represent our new matrix, which is called traditional. The gray dots represent the original matrix. You can see that they're, for the most part, they're superimposable, right? They don't really shift, you know, very strongly. So we essentially generated the same compensation matrix. Now, if you want to apply this compensation matrix to your samples, right? Let's say you want to apply them to your test uh, samples here. You can click and drag the M button onto the group, right? Or you can click and drag onto an individual sample, right? So like I'm doing here. So it's really up to you what you wanna do. I'm gonna go ahead and just make everything uniform so that they're all the same. All right, last one we'll talk about here and call it quits is auto spill. So if you wanna do auto spill, you just select auto spill and then all you have to do here is get rid of the universal negative. So all auto spill needs is really just the cleanup gate. That's all it needs. Okay, and then all those are blank. You see that there's spread in the data. If there's spread in the data, this is usually a good thing. Like this is what helps the algorithm because it builds a linear, robust linear regression curve. And that's what allows it to um, create the compensation matrix for us. So with beads, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of spread, right? We have a negative and a positive and nothing in the middle, but hey, that's all we can do in this experiment. But it's definitely worth giving this a shot. I would, I, yeah, I would do it because it requires less effort and who knows, sometimes you may find that you get a better matrix. Okay, so we'll do auto spill here. And I say view matrix, right? I didn't do hardly any work for that, right? And look how quickly I get a compensation matrix. 
And then on top of that, right, if we zoom out, this matrix looks pretty, you know, looks pretty clean. I don't have a lot of bending and we can also compare it right to the traditional method. And here again, we're comparing now the red cells versus the blue or the red dots versus the blue dots. The blue dots are a little bit hard to see on some of these plots, but that's because again, the two matrices are virtually superimposable with one another. So again, a lot less work generated practically the same matrix. So I would, again, I would recommend that you uh, give this one a shot. Okay. And uh, yeah, other than that, guys, I think saving your work, right? Click save as, and you can say here, save as workspace or save as, uh, this is the um, ACS files format. This one actually will embed all of the files into the workspace. So you can easily share the entire workspace and it will actually have the FCS files in it. And of course you can also save it as a template if you are gonna do repetitive types of analyses. And the cool thing here too, is I can save all of this to uh, BD Research Cloud. So again, I can save my work and I can easily share it with other people if I am on uh, BD Research Cloud. Okay, with that, I'll take any questions that you guys have. Be, you know, feel free to uh, post anything in the chat. I'll wait a couple of minutes here. I know we went a little bit longer than the hour and 15, but in, in any case, I hope it was useful. And uh, yeah, I'll wait here until my clock says about five, let's say 5.30, I don't know, 5.38. If I don't see any questions, I'll bid you guys a rest of, uh, you know, good rest of your day. And hope to see you next time, maybe for one of the advanced sessions. Ah, yeah. So the um, I am recording this. Um, I am recording this session. Um, I personally will not have the recording, but I'll show you where you can get it. So if you just go to flojo.com. So let me just type that in my browser here. Ah, I hate when it auto fills and you don't want it to auto fill. I mean, you'll get to the same place regardless, but here I'm on flojo.com and I'm gonna ignore the little drop downs here, but you go to the learn tab and see learn here and then go to webinars. And then if you scroll down, so I'm obviously giving today's webinar right now, but if you scroll down, you'll see explore previously recorded webinars. If you click on this recorded webinars button, this will take you to our page where we have all the recorded stuff. So you can see all of the other um, recordings that we have here. So we've gone over Cluster Explorer, we've gone over Easy Daffy, we've gone over a lot of different things, right? Plug and play, et cetera. So this one will be posted probably, I'm guessing it'll probably be posted tomorrow, but this is where it will be posted, okay? You are welcome. Any other questions? There are also a bunch of other resources here that are quite useful. I like all the recorded webinars, but if you go to Flojo University, we have a lot of um, short video tutorials here. So if there's just a particular, you know, session that you're interested in, like, you know, let's say QC, or you want to do compensation, for example, there's a lot of short compensation. Um, tutorials here that aren't, aren't usually very long. Oh, I'm glad you found it helpful. You're very welcome. I'm, that's what we're here for. So feel free to uh, send us an email. I should also say that, you know, we have a tech support email as well. So if you run into tech support issues, you can always send 
an email here to tech support. So that's flojo support at bd.com. My email is listed above, probably not as good for the, you know, troubleshooting of Flojo proper, but if you have a question about your compensation or, you know, about the assay that you're doing or whatever, by all means, you can reach out, send me an email.